Was Fallout entertaining? Yeah! Was it well crafted? No! What do you mean no? That's what Chris Avalon had to say about the Fallout TV show in his two-part review. He had some choice words for the show. For those of you who might not know who this gentleman is, he provided us with a list explaining what makes him so qualified, along with a list of why you may want to completely disregard his review, just to be fair. But long story short, he worked on a lot of Fallout games. I am not going to read verbatim his entire review, you should really read it yourself. I am leaving links to them in the description box. There are just certain things that he says that I would like to commentate on. Like this. Did the show feel uneven? Yes. While the ghoul calls out the irritation of being sidetracked in one scene and you can yuck yuck about him complaining about side quests, the issue is the writers have more control over a TV plot than a game plot, so they should use it, not embrace the game's chaos. I mean, use every episode in a quality manner. That's not so hard. Keep the pace consistent, keep the focus going where it needs to. That's where TV shines. You can literally force the viewer to only look at what you want to see, unlike a video game. Play to the strengths of the medium you're using, that's all he's saying. Side questing as fan service in this fashion could be detrimental in the long run. You only have 8 episodes. By the final episode, it did feel like we were missing an episode. But that's just what it was for me personally. A feeling. Oddly enough, I felt the same way going into the last episode of X-Men 97. Think about how long they spent in Vault 4 just for a joke. Compared to say, when Maximus needed a piece of his armor fixed, but he didn't have the money. The side quest for him to get the money was selling some teeth. Sure, it happens quickly and off screen, but it kept the show focused on moving forward with the main story. Does the series embody the core narratives of later fallouts, 3 and 4? Yep, as soon as Lucy says, I need to find my dad, which has been the plot of most of Bethesda Fallout, so yeah, we've all seen the meme. But this always makes me laugh because I like to imagine that Emil thought he was being so clever. So, in Fallout 3, you have to find your dad, right? But get this, in Fallout 4, you're the dad, and you're trying to find your kid. Eh? Eh? And Todd was like, <sighs> good enough. Music. So just to get this out of the way, the music's great and very much in keeping with Fallout. Even better, the lyrics emphasize what's transpiring in the scene. And that's pretty classy. They used a lot of Dinah Washington, I noticed. Maybe at one of the more dramatic moments of season two, they can use the song Bitter Earth. The lyrics can definitely fit. The ghoul suddenly revealing that the power armor has a flaw that guarantees insta-kills is problematic based on the gunfight in episode 2. The fact he didn't exploit the armor's weakness when Maximus seemed to have the upper hand in episode 2's shootout was confusing in retrospect. There wasn't really any explanation for why not use his knowledge there versus later beyond crafting a dramatic moment in episode 8, at which point most watchers aren't going to remember episode 2 unless, like me, you rewatch the series and questions come up. It might be possible it's the tempered lining, but if so, you need to explicitly say that after the bloodbath in episode 8, which could have been fixed by the ghoul saying a single line before slaughtering the soldiers. The ghoul could have mentioned it or alluded to it in some way in his fight with Maximus as well. I was confused in retrospect too, because it's not like he shot a few bullets and realized it wasn't working. He just kept shooting at him and laughing. I guess they just wanted to leave it up for the audience to figure out for some reason. Minor point, also speaking of that fight, Maximus getting his superpowered leg stuck in floorboards felt flimsy as fuck. I was almost embarrassed for the choreographer because he didn't sell it with the scene and props. I mentioned this in my video on the show. The power armor is able to generate a lot of force in both its arms and legs. We see him doing this just a few minutes before. But now he can't pull it out of some wood? And one last thing about the fight at the end between the ghoul and the Brotherhood soldiers. He turned off the lights and used the darkness to get the upper hand. The power armor helmets have flashlights attached to them. Why didn't anybody turn them on? There's a type of acting called facial acting that I don't think Maximus is very good at or was given poor direction for. And it would have helped in a lot of critical scenes. Norman also has moments where it's not clear what he's reacting to or why. So it's just not Maximus. I was talking to my brother about the show and it was because of this that he thought that Maximus had to be some kind of psychopath. It was good that Maximus has a tie back to Shady Sands, but the Brotherhood angle there, the soldier who saves him, confuses that. 
Was it the Brotherhood who did it somehow at Hank's urging? That doesn't seem to fit. Or did the Brotherhood come after? Confusing and some clarity there would have been nice. I think the Brotherhood came after. A nuke went off and they're thinking, how could that have happened? Who has access to that kind of technology except maybe us? We have to investigate. The other NCR states also got word of their capital being nuked. Eh. I did get an alternate take on the Titus scene from a Microsoft employee who, correctly, pointed out that the script for this feels really forced. It's basically hammering you over the head to make sure you realize that Maximus has no choice to the point of having Knight Titus repeatedly threaten Maximus just in case the audience doesn't get it. So in that respect, the craftsmanship of the dialogue is poor. I can see that perspective, and the staging of the scene feels a little less convincing. I still appreciate the choice Maximus faced though. Minor point, it was hilarious to see Titus running from the bear. I thought it was funny too, but I was also thinking, man, why is this knight such a little bitch? Oh, it's Michael Rappaport. Yeah, that makes sense. And yes, they very quickly and relentlessly made sure that his character is disliked by the audience. You stupid motherfucker, it's all your fault. Yeah, you straight up. <laughs> the idea that Chris Parnell descended from gulpers is just, huh? Did he come out of one of their eggs? Was he cloned from one of their mouth fingers? Sure. See, I thought that gulper was a relative of his who was transformed into a gulper. But yeah, the show just doesn't make a habit of explaining too much. So, who knows? I was a little surprised that so much was left to loot in Vault 32, after the raiders supposedly went through it. I figured they would have taken everything, especially all the Pip-Boys, and they would have needed the uniforms. It's heavily implied later on in the show that a working Pip-Boy can fetch you a pretty cap. So yeah, why didn't they take them? The fact that the vaults are so exposed and easy to find also didn't feel appropriate for the series, and felt like a conflict with the earlier fallouts. The reason for this is plausibility. I can't imagine that the Wastelanders wouldn't find a way to blast into these if they could find them, and hiding them would have been better, like Fall 13 and Fallout 1. This got me thinking. Before the show, the most quote-unquote exposed vaults we've had thus far, I guess, would be Vault 111, Vault 3, and maybe Vault 21. We don't know what it looked like before the hotel was built over it. I'm surprised that Vault 33's entrance wasn't like Vault 11, or vice versa. They both had elevators going to the surface, but ultimately the most exposed vault we've ever seen has to be Vault 4. And for what we can see, maybe a few scratches here and there, but nothing to indicate any explosives being used on it. Maybe most people thought Vault Dwellers all died out and there's just monsters left inside them. I don't know. Moving on. Inconsistent lore. Ghoul Pharma. Can anyone tell me anything concrete about ghoul physiology? Anyone. The whole serum that causes and prevents feral ghoul behavior was a mess. This is something that's only cropped up in recent fallouts, but seriously, WTF. So in this section, he goes off on this ghoul serum because he's absolutely right. This is a mess. My question is, why was it even necessary? Why introduce this into the lore and create inconsistencies? It's not like the voice modulation on the power armor helmets. With that, I felt like they wrote the story and someone went, wait a minute, won't the bully recognize Maximus' voice? Power armor doesn't change your voice that much. Fuck! But another serum that turns you into a ghoul? Okay, first of all, ghouls are not quite this resistant to bullets. Secondly, they don't heal this fast unless they're basically swimming in high levels of radiation. So either they made a mistake, or this guy wasn't turned into a ghoul at all. The chalkboard of history. Why doesn't the bomb explosion have a date on the chalkboard? That could have solved a lot of questions. Yes, it really could have. Instead, Todd Howard has to come out and clarify. It's not like the characters in the show don't know when it happened. I was 11 and traveled with her to Philly three days walk from home and we could still feel the heat from the blast. So then write it down! Even though the drawing doesn't seem positioned for it, the best I could come up with was this. Someone was working on it and ran out of time. Whoops! It's that time of day again. I gotta go get naked and drink blood in order to worship this one lady for no reason. Talking about gulpers. While I know they are East Coast in Fallout 4, seeing these creatures when they've never shown up in an earlier game on the West Coast was weird. I kind of wish they'd gone for something that was clearly in the West Coast fallouts, or just spent that budget on a Deathclaw. When I first saw the creature in the trailer, my mind did consider Gulper, but I thought, nah, that's impossible. 
we've only ever seen them in Maine. It has to be something else. Since they didn't look quite the same either after all. But no, Gulper, somehow. Maybe it was a recent escape thing from Vault 4, like post Fallout 2? That's the best I got. The destruction of Shady Sands. This was out of left field. And it felt even weirder when you see the crater and all the other buildings standing in the background. They survived not one, but two nuclear blasts. He had to admit it had been built to last. Moldaver's connection to NCR and her apparent role as head of the NCR isn't made clear for seven and a half episodes other than some wacky cult leader in the hills mentions, which I still don't understand. I don't understand the formation of the cult. You have people getting naked, rubbing ashes of the dead on themselves, and drinking blood. All to worship an ex-official of the new California Republic? That'd be like if people started having sex with loaves of bread to worship Gavin Newsom's bitch ass. Deep within a bleak and dismal swamp, hidden beneath its murky waters, lies the headquarters of the most sinister villains of all time. This title is hilarious. Frederick Sinclair from Dead Money, representing Big Empty, was weird. Also, despite his depiction at the Clown Council, I never saw Sinclair as an asshole would purposely murder or harm people in experiments. There are numerous terminal entries in Dead Money that make Sinclair's position clear. He put the health and well-being of his workers ahead of construction timetables, and he even couldn't bring himself to hurt those who betrayed him the most. But I guess he would have had to play it and understood it which would have taken a little research. Oh well, moving on. Robert House. It's weird for him to be involved in let's potentially nuke the world to maintain share prices negotiations given his presence and stance in New Vegas. By 2065, I deemed it a mathematical certainty that an atomic war would devastate the Earth within 15 years. Every projection I ran confirmed it. I knew I couldn't save the world, nor did I care to, but I could save Vegas, and in the process, perhaps save mankind. I set to work immediately. I thought I had plenty of time to prepare. As it turned out, I was 20 hours short. This one had me on the ropes too, but I kept thinking about it. Cooper's daughter looks exactly the same throughout the flashbacks before the Legion of Doom meeting and the day the bombs fell. So this meeting is taking place close to 2077. By that time, House concluded that the bombs were coming, he had his anti-nuke measures in place, his Securitron army was all packed up, and he was deep into the platinum chip design. So I imagine House would be like, Pass. Oh, so you guys want to potentially nuke the place yourselves and run some goofy ass experiments for no reason? Yeah. Nah. I'm gonna go make sure Vegas is okay, because that's all I really care about. The real bad guy is... Management. In this section, Mr. Avalon criticizes our secret antagonist's plan, and I agree. When I was writing my review video, I had a section about this same thing that I ultimately left out. I figured it could be its own video, or people simply accept it because, hey, it's vault they're evil, they don't have to make sense. But to keep it nice and short, Bud Askins, I like to call him Bud Askis, is a fucking idiot. Breathe super managers? No fuck with. That's not gonna happen. Clearly. Uh, I voted for Betty. On its face, it's a dumb idea. But nobody in this super villain powwow had the inclination to be like, that's a stupid idea, you piece of shit. And you should be ashamed of yourself for even thinking about it. Fool. Now, Chris wants to remind everyone that this is simply his opinion, along with some of my own throughout this video. If you enjoy something, then enjoy it to your heart's content. I am not going to tell you what he rated the show, because you should read his words for yourself. Links are in the description, have a good one.